morning. And I'm delighted to join you here today for the Brisbane Water Learning Community School Development Day. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we join you from the land of the Dark and Jung people, pay respects to their elders past and present, and recognise their ongoing care of country and community for many tens of thousands of years. I'd also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal people here, as well as everyone that's joining us today, committed to make a difference in the lives of our Aboriginal students, our local community, and those that are part of our public education family. If you are joining us from off country, I also pay respects to the elders from the lands on which you're joining us, recognising that some people may be joining us if they're on leave, excited to give up the first day of their leave to join us here for the School Development Day. I'd also like to pay a particular tribute to Murray Goolagong, who's designed the magnificent artwork that you see behind me over my shoulder. Murray is regarded as a highly talented artist and it's his energy and enthusiasm, as well as passion, in his role as an AEO and as an artist, that he continues to contribute to our public education system, as well as his contributions to his roles with the AECG. So thank you, Murray. I look forward to sharing this journey in the next 40 minutes or so, and I'm going to start by sharing the Aboriginal Outcomes and Partnerships Directorate. My name is Karen Jones. I'm the Executive Director of Aboriginal Outcomes and Partnerships. It's a directorate in Sydney, part of the Education and Skills Reform Division. And within our directorate, we have four teams. The first of the teams that I'll outline today are the Research and Engagement Unit that are part of our Action Outcomes and Partnerships Directorate. Tanya Neal is the director, and she leads two teams within that unit, the Policy and Engagement Team, which has responsibility for negotiations of external providers and external contracts that support our schools through the provision of additional programs. A key part of her work is negotiations with the New South Wales AECG, who continue to provide a number of professional learning initiatives, such as Healthy Culture, Healthy Country, as well as STEM camps, show camps, and language and culture camps across New South Wales for Aboriginal students. Complementing the policy and engagement team is the languages, culture, and communities teams. We have five language and culture nests here in New South Wales, complemented by two language and culture satellite nests. Those seven nests are all in the northern part of New South Wales, indeed the top part. And so for us, our focus will be on growing those language and culture nests, as well as creating opportunities for other people to engage with professional learning as they introduce languages programs into schools. We were delighted in 2021 to introduce for the first time in early years grant funding for languages made available to our departmental preschools across New South Wales to commence teaching language in those areas where Aboriginal language groups locally determined that was appropriate. In addition, we've started work on developing opportunities for our students in secondary settings to do Certificates 1 and Certificates 2 in Aboriginal languages, and they're delivered by TAFE in partnership with us as we look to broaden the opportunities for language and culture across New South Wales, taught on country by traditional custodians of language, traditional owners of language, and many traditional language speakers who are fluent in their language, as well as those learning Aboriginal languages for the first time. Aboriginal languages are a challenge across New South Wales given past government policies and practices, and we're delighted to be involved in the revitalisation of Aboriginal languages and we work closely with Aboriginal Affairs New South Wales in this work. The Premier's Priority Unit was established last year and our Director Sally Kubiak joined us during last year. That team has a focus on delivering the Premier's Priority, which is to increase by 50% the number of Aboriginal students achieving their HSC by 2023, our current Year 10 cohort, and complementing that academic achievement is the second part of the Premier's priority target, which is around maintaining Aboriginal cultural identity of our students. Within the Premier's priority unit, there are two teams, the Project and Data Services team, which pulls together on behalf of our directorate and works very closely with CC, a number of our data sets that are required in order for us to make informed decisions on how best to support our schools. We also have, as part of that Premier's priority unit, a secondary education initiatives team, that focus on the Premier's priority, its communication strategy, 
our field work that's conducted across the state to see the many great things happening in our public schools, as well as the leadership resource that we're currently working on with DELs and principals to best support and better support leadership in our schools in partnership with Aboriginal leadership in local communities. The Learning Schools Strategy Unit, led by Sam Ricketts, who was previously the principal at Gorican, has two teams, the Aboriginal Education Strategy Team, who have responsibility for the statewide staff room, and thank you to those people that have joined us in some of those sessions, for the development of the 10-year plan for our directorate. That 10-year plan has been developed so we can map out pathways to achieve both our commitments in the partnership agreement with the New South Wales AECG, which was launched last year, and that partnership agreement is called Walking Together, Working Together, and you can see the link with the wording to footsteps to the future. But it also links to Premier's priorities, executive priorities of our department, as well as the targets under OCA and the Commonwealth's refresh closing the gap. We also know that we've had a strong focus in the past 12 months on the Aboriginal Teacher Leadership Initiative, specifically supporting Aboriginal staff in their aspirations for those that are interested in promotions positions. And we are absolutely delighted that in 2021, a leadership module in the leadership credential titled Aboriginal Education became part of our leadership credential for the first time, recognising that prior to people applying for principals positions, there was an opportunity for them to participate in some learning about leading Aboriginal education. The Aboriginal Education Strategy Team is complemented by the schooling team, which is made up entirely of people from teaching backgrounds. One of the strengths of our directorate is every position that is calling for staff from teaching backgrounds is filled by an Aboriginal staff member, reflecting the strong commitment our department's made in recent years to increasing the number of Aboriginal teaching staff in schools. Fortunately, we can't have all the positions in our directorate filled in the public service sector because we haven't got the depth yet of Aboriginal staff, but we're delighted that all our teaching positions can be identified and filled by proud Aboriginal people working within our directorate. Our schooling team leads a number of key initiatives. They lead the learning and engagement centres, the executive priority which complements the Premier's priority. The executive priority draws attention to the fact that the HSC is not the only achievement that students can achieve after 13 years of engagement with our public education family but rather there are various pathways that are just as critically successful and are great opportunities for many Aboriginal students that are not necessarily working towards the achievement of the HSC. So the executive priority complements the Premier's priority and recognises that our approach to all students should be personalised, should be about meeting the individual dreams and hopes and aspirations for Aboriginal students and also recognising that we are not a homogenous group as Aboriginal people, our sense of identity is wound up collectively, but also wound up much more locally with our own mob. But we are not academically similar. We have diversity across our Aboriginal students. And whilst we are, accept that we're overrepresented currently in the lower bands and certainly underrepresented in the top bands, we have achievement at all levels. And so recognising we're not homogenous is a very important part of the executive priority and the premier's priority working together, complementing one another so that students can choose in their later years of secondary the correct pathway for their own future dreams and aspirations. We also know that the schooling team provides strong curriculum support and advice. And one of the strengths of that schooling team is we're not all based in Parramatta. Our schooling team is based from Wagga to Ballina and out to training reflecting that the viewpoints of both the rural and remote, the coastal and the regional areas, are part of our decision making. Our fourth team in our directorate is called Kimberwali, and Kimberwali is the centre of excellence in Western Sydney for the Aboriginal community out there. That was just a quick introduction to the directorate that I'm privileged to lead. And whilst we're going to spend some time in the coming slides unpacking specific data for Brisbane Water Learning Community, I remind you that teaching in a strong public education system is much more than the data I'm going to present to you. Those opportunities that you create for students 
in celebrations such as creative arts and performances, science and technology, are integral to the memories they'll carry forever, to their sense of confidence in who they are and their sense of well-being. So I don't want you to think when I talk around some of the data sets that are in the coming slides that that's what I value most. What I value is each and every day in our classrooms that you deliver opportunities for students to thrive, to grow in confidence and recognise that the things that we're talking about here are a collective story of students' learning journeys. But we unpack those learning stories down to individual student level because that's where we make the difference. We talk around the figures and those figures are around the collections. But we need to remember that that's the numbers. When we start to talk about meeting the individual needs of students, we need to drill down to student level. So we need to know the numbers at a state level, the numbers at your school, the names of the students, and then we drill down to the needs. So as I unpack that, I want you to be conscious. Brisbane Order Learning Community has a strong and proud history of working in Aboriginal education. The Aboriginal cultural continuum that you developed a number of years ago is an exemplary model of how you've worked with the Karana Local ACG and together developed something that continues to be in operation today. That is an opportunity for Aboriginal students to connect across the schools, the five primary schools and the one secondary college that make up Brisbane Water Learning Community. Our primary schools, Woiwoi, Woiwoi South, Empire Bay, Edelong and Yamina are diverse even though they're part of the Brisbane Water Learning Community. And our Brisbane Water Secondary College is a most unusual structure with the students on the Yamina campus being seven to nine and the Woiwoi campus being seven to 10. Sorry, being 10 to 12, my apologies. But I do recognise this. The strength of that secondary college is something that we need to celebrate in our primary schools. You are one of the learning communities that focuses on P to 12, from preschool to year 12. Recognising that journey of learning is continuous is a major piece of the work that you continue to undertake in the learning community. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the members of the Brisbane Water Secondary College who've worked tirelessly to create seamless learning from 7 to 12 for our students in the secondary college. You can see the enrolments for Aboriginal students from 2017 to 2020 on the next slide. That's for all the schools across the Brisbane Water Learning Community. And that's just so you've got a context for the schools in addition to your school. I know that you'll know the numbers for your school, but just so you have an idea of the numbers of Aboriginal students in the school up the road that's part of the learning community. I'm going to talk around NAPLAN targets for Aboriginal students, specifically in the top three bands. We know that schools are offered a target only if they meet specific criteria, and that is that they need to have more than 15 Aboriginal students participate in NAPLAN across the two years in their setting. For primaries, it's three and five, and for secondaries, it's seven and nine. We also know that Woi Woi, Woi Woi South and Empire Bay do not have targets because they do not have enough Aboriginal students to make considered decisions on setting targets. However, Etalong and Yamina Beach have set targets for themselves. I'm going to share with you some of their specific data and celebrate some of the successes they, like you, have been achieving in recent years. Brisbane Water Secondary College has a target for the Yamina campus as it has years seven and nine. But clearly there's no target set for Woiwoi campus when it comes to NAPLAN. However, there are HSC targets for that school. When we look at Edelong Public School, you can see the volatility in the data outcomes. You can see that graph swings wildly. That's not a reflection of the quality of the teaching. That's actually an indication of the diversity of the students in their school. We need to recognise, as I mentioned earlier, that our Aboriginal students are not homogenous. We're not all the same. And our academic success is as diverse as the number of students you have in your schools. But there are a number of very positive things I'd want to draw attention to. When we look at the reading for Edelong, you can see that upward trajectory in the last couple of years, which has actually allowed them to exceed the target for 2020. Congratulations to everyone that's been involved in that focus on reading there. 
But you can also see in the numeracy, they continue to focus on numeracy specifically for Aboriginal students. But you can see that's been, in recent years, continued to be volatile, up and down, compared to reading, which is on the upward trajectory. We know that the smaller the number of students, the less reliable the data is. So we know that this volatility comes about because of the cohort of students. But it's worth looking at because there's that significant celebration there in reading. And I look forward to similar success in numeracy. Uminer Beach has also had targets set for them, for Aboriginal students in the top two band, top three bands, so my apologies. What we do know is that last year they achieved the target that was set, but again, you can see a level of volatility across the years. So what we're looking for is much more of a trend similar to what we see in numeracy. Yes, there has been volatility, but you can see them starting to settle and getting an upward trajectory over time. So those numeracy results for New and Minor Beach are to be celebrated. They've exceeded their target, they've matched their target for reading, but you can see that pattern of greater consistency for numeracy is something to be celebrated. So congratulations to all the staff involved in that achievement. We come to Brisbane Water Secondary College, year seven to nine, and again focused on that plan for the students in the top three bands. You can see less volatility, but you can see those ups and downs that might come from particular student cohorts. What we do know is last year again, Brisbane Water, the Amina campus achieved the target that had been set for their Aboriginal students in the top three bands. Work continues to be done around numeracy. But we do know that the strategies that are in place in all three of these schools, as well as in your schools, give us confidence that the directions and the work of our staff are delivering the difference that we may not yet see in some of the data sets, but are making a difference through the confidence of our students. So when we look at these data sets, just be reminded that there continues to be volatility even when you have more than 15 students, and you see that in some of the slides more than the others, but also recognise that NAPLAN results follow improvements in classroom practice. They're not immediate. NAPLAN is the first external consistency of teacher judgement. It either reaffirms what you already know about a student, or it might challenge you, is that performance reflective of what you see in the classroom? It is one indicator on the particular day in which the assessment was undertaken. But compare that to the information you have in school and you know about these students. Remember, these are the numbers. At a school level, you'll be drilling down to the names and the needs of individual students and putting in place strategies to support them. When we look at HSC, and we particularly talk about retention to the HSC, we look at the students in Year 9 and how many of that cohort completed Year 12 and completed their HSC. When we look at Brisbane Water Secondary College, we can see currently about 38% of Aboriginal students complete their HSC. We compare that to 55% of non-Aboriginal students. This is not a result of the quality of teaching at the school. This is a direct result of the impact of past government practices and policies have had on a journey for Aboriginal people over many hundreds of years. Recent policies and practice continue to impact on families today. When I was in primary school, it was not until I started high school that I was safe at school. Every year at primary school, under the clean, clad and courteous, I could have been excluded from primary school based on another parent not wishing me to be at that school. My mother always encouraged me to keep my head down and my mouth shut so I didn't get in trouble and draw attention to myself. And I've never been someone to either keep my head down or keep my mouth shut. So I was a challenge to her, unlike my brother, who's significantly different in appearance, although he has the same head, he's darker skin than I am. I know that those years were hard on us because mum was always fearful that we could be excluded from school. Mum, who had not engaged successfully at school, had been denied the quality of education she deserved, wanted us to have a successful education. She wanted us to access education. 
And for us, it was a fearful time. If we had conflict with another student, we were scared to tell mum because we were worried that she'd spend all her energy caring that that other parent would want us excluded. Those policies still live in the living memory of parents, grandparents and great-grandparents who are nurturing our students in our schools today. So when we think it was a long time ago, it's not a long time ago when it's in living memory. So we do at times jump to the wrong conclusions about our public schools, but we can overcome that through strong, productive partnerships. We also know there have been Dell targets set for the Brisbane Water area. And the Brisbane Water Secondary College has a responsibility to set about 50% towards the achievement of the whole network's targets because of the number of Aboriginal students in this particular college compared to other schools in this network. We do know this. We constantly talk about things like 50% in percentage improvements. But we also know when we're talking about it at school, we drill down to the names and the needs of the students. And you can see on this slide, the comment is that we need to increase the number of students. But for us, it's six Aboriginal students in Brisbane Water Secondary College. Six additional students we will keep from year nine to year 12 to complete their HSC, in addition to those that complete, complete year 12 but not necessarily a HSC. We are talking about meeting the individual needs of students. So when we talk again around increasing by 50% and we know the baseline target for this network was 44%, we need to be focused not just on that percentage rate, but on the number of students that we're going to put wraparound support to live a better life opportunities for them, for their future families, for their current families, as well as for our communities in a more broad sense. Six students additional from year nine to year 12 by 2023, that contribution from Brisbane Water Secondary College will contribute to the achievement of the Dell target will contribute to the achievement of the Premier's priority, but much more importantly, will create better life opportunities for those six Aboriginal students, in addition to the others that complete Year 12. So what does the literature suggest that we could be doing better? Well, we do know there are a number of things that are already in place here at Brisbane Water Secondary College. Your strong, productive partnership with the Karana Local ACG is one such example of a great practice that needs to be embedded across schools. And let's look at what the literature suggests we could be doing. So let's have a look at what works to increase outcomes for Aboriginal students. And you can see in front of you, fairly straightforward, but let's have the conversation around them. Engaging families and forming trusting relationships. Our families look towards public education as the single most powerful vehicle to deliver a socially just Australian society, as well as to deliver a difference in the lives of all our students. But engaging with our Aboriginal families, who themselves might have had difficult and complex journeys in their own school pathways, is important to build those relationships. They are the responsibility from the very first day they come to a school setting to join us. It is not the responsibility for each and every school to do that in isolation. It is a responsibility for each and every one of us to build confidence in our public education system as well as the local school in which they're seeking enrolment. Engaging families, knowing them, building their confidence in who we are and building our confidence that we can have frank and robust conversations about best meeting the needs of their students. Take the time to know your families. Take the time to engage with them and recognise that's a foundational piece to get it more right, particularly for Aboriginal students. We know that place-based approaches to literacy programs is also critical when we look at the literature. And whilst there's been much research done on Aboriginal students, that research is not all New South Wales based, and it's large in number, but small in cohort in the number of students engaged in the literature. So we do know that these are patterns across a range of research papers, a range of literature pieces around what suggests will work for Aboriginal students. 
We know that place-based response approaches to literacy programs reflect a very important need for us to get more writer connection with local information. And we know we often do that very, very well when kids start kindergarten, when they read a little book about them at their new school. How do we embed some of the local cultural knowledge in some of our literacy programs is an opportunity that we can further explore. It's about the local context. Creating writing opportunities one such way that we can engage Aboriginal students, particularly when they've been on country. So I'd encourage you to continue to focus on those place-based approaches. Culturally responsive pedagogy remains a key element for us. We need to know more about the local Aboriginal cultural knowledge so we can embed it in the practices of our classrooms. It's not just the students having the knowledge, it's our staff having the knowledge. And not just a historical perspective, but the local perspective. Our kids need to see this local area in their classroom. They need to serve the local knowledge engaged in this classroom. Culturally responsive pedagogical practices seen in our classrooms links very strongly to high expectations, high expectations of students by their parents and by our staff, high expectations of staff by students and their parents, and high expectations of parents from students and the staff. Those high expectations are critical as we work together to best meet the needs of our students. Conversations around high expectations and engaging families can be achieved through really strong, productive, personalised learning pathways. And it's interesting, people tend to focus when they have a conversation with me on the piece of paper. The piece of paper is the documentation. The relationships that are formed when we discuss what students are talking about they hope to achieve in the coming months or the coming year is something that we engage strongly with families. Deep, meaningful conversations around the individual student. Students knowing what their goals are in their PLPs, linking students' hopes and aspirations to the achievement of their PLP targets is one such way we can not only lift our expectations, lift their own expectations of what's possible for them, but engage families. Personalised learning pathways are critical. I'd also say this, some of the best personalised approaches I've seen in schools have actually been in our secondary schools around careers. They are around conversations, talking to kids, getting to know them even better, putting around the wraparound support that they need to achieve their quiet hopes and aspirations through a personalised learning pathway is critical to their short and long-term success at school. The value of a student's culture and wellbeing is central to school activities. Make no mistake, when kids know they're valued at school, they are more likely to come. Our students know how we feel about them and they get that sense not just by the words but the, by the relationships and the actions that we demonstrate each and every day. Students get excited, Aboriginal students in particular, when they see themselves in curriculum delivery, when they see aunts and uncles, cousins, relatives coming and presenting, whether it be leading, start through professional learning, whether it be sharing some on-country experiences or leading some cultural knowledge learning, on site, at the school, is a way that families see their knowledge is valued. Their knowledge values the contributions of our public schools. Their Aboriginal cultural knowledge is central to students' sense of identity. It needs to be pulled together and integral to the work that we do as school activities. And you can see the Aboriginal cultural continuum that Brisbane Water innovatively developed many years ago as a learning community continues to be one such example in which we can do all of the ones above through that continuum. You were a lighthouse and continue to be a lighthouse through that curriculum, that, sorry, that continuum. That continuum was outstanding at the time and continues to be an exemplar practice. It embeds the first five that I've spoken about, about what the literature tells us will increase outcomes for Aboriginal students. And the final one is support for post-school education and career pathways. We need to recognise that the HSC is one pathway to future success, but there are many non-HSC pathways that are just as valuable for Aboriginal students. And those conversations do not start in Year 10. 
Those conversations start in kindergarten as we welcome students to their third and year learning journey with the Brisbane Water Learning Community. When we talk to them around their results each year when they're planning their personalised learning pathways in conversations with you and their parents or their carers, that we're talking about the opportunities that they can create for themselves through embracing the opportunities that we give them through the extraordinary work that you deliver each and every day in your classroom. Conversations around Year 12 attainment are not finalised and made in Years 10, 11 and 12. They start many years earlier when we talk to the students about what's required to achieve their hopes and aspirations. When we unpack with them dreams beyond what they might have imagined possible for them, we each and every one of us has a responsibility to be talking about completion of Year 12 because it makes such a significant and profound difference to life opportunities for our students, but particularly our Aboriginal students. Following on from those conversations around career pathways, let's look at what the literature suggests we should be doing for increasing Year 12 or HSC attainment for our Aboriginal students. Well, firstly, acknowledgement of and support for Aboriginal students embedded in school culture and leadership creating opportunities for their contribute to decision-making in schools, bringing their cultural knowledge into the leadership decisions of your school are critical. Continue to have higher expectations for Aboriginal students, recognising the very positive ripple effect that it has for other Aboriginal students that are to follow, for our school and our community relationships. Recognising when parents see we believe in their kids, our students, that they are more confident in us. When parents see in our actions that we believe that their student and their child can achieve great things, they believe in us more fully. We need to work with families to continue to build their confidence. And in each and every of the, one of the transition points, we know we're rebuilding relationships. But we start by contributing for the prior setting, whether it be the primary school or the seven and nine campus, to be talking up the next setting in which our students will be entering. Recognising that we are a continuum of learning from preschool to year 12 here in the Brisbane Water Learning Community. Getting to know more about what's happening in our other school sites is one way we contribute to our parents' confidence. Parents often have confidence in the school in which their child's enrolled and they're often unsure when they move to a secondary setting. So for us in primary, we have a key responsibility to know those good news stories, perhaps about the students from our school that have gone on to the secondary setting and share them very publicly. Share the celebrations of the achievements at the secondary setting and build the confidence of the parents even before they've made contact or sought enrolment at the secondary setting. We need to continue to focus on a whole child, a whole student approach where their cultural value is seen each and every day where Aboriginal cultural knowledge is valued in our classrooms, is valued in our schools. I cannot more strongly support staff's professional learning in activities like connecting to country. Get to know more about this local area. Talk about that learning in your classrooms. Talk about that learning with your Aboriginal students. Get your Aboriginal students to contribute to your ongoing professional learning. Recognise that each and every day in our public schools we continue to learn from one another. Our strength is not just going outside. Our strength in our learning is ongoing within our schools. Your colleagues in your staff rooms, in your schools and your school community will contribute to your professional learning. Don't underestimate it, don't undervalue it, but celebrate the opportunities that you can create. Explicit teaching remains important for us. We need to be clear about what students are learning as a direct result of our instruction. It is not a necessarily a direct instruction approach. It's not like a kindergarten handwriting lesson. But it is about knowing what are we expecting students to understand as a result of what I'm teaching them. They need to be critical in our heads before we can support our students. That's what explicit teaching is really all about. And the final thing is quite an unusual one that people often think is tokenistic, but the literature, t literature tells us it's critically important. Employing Aboriginal staff, whether it be teaching staff, 
liaison staff, front office staff, anyone that can build relationships with the Aboriginal community is critical. But it's also critical for our students. Our Aboriginal students see themselves in our schools, not just as students then, but as teachers, as school learning support officers, as principals. So when we employ Aboriginal staff, it is a strong conduit to building relationships with the community, but it has much more of a profound effect for the rest of the community in seeing that we value Aboriginal people, that we recognise the strengths of Aboriginal people and we recognise the contributions they make to making our school a better place. So when we talk around employing Aboriginal staff, people often think it is only about building relationships with the Aboriginal community. It's so much more than that. It's about building confidence in who we are as a public education system, inclusive and reflective of our local community. And one way we can do that is through employing additional Aboriginal staff, whether it be in identified or non-identified positions. So now it's over to questions. And I won't be able to take them personally because we can't have a chat because I've pre-filmed this presentation. I'm actually down at Shoalhaven as you're watching this doing another presentation. But I would like to make this offer. If you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, if you something you'd like me to know or you'd like to share with me, please feel confident to email me. My address, like all of yours, is very similar. You know the end of it, so I'll share the beginning. It's Karen.Jones21. I'll say that again, Karen Jones 21 at det.nsw.edu.au. Now, clearly, someone with a sense of humour gave me that 21 because clearly I'm not. But I will say this I'm very happy to take emails from any of you. Suggestions, celebrations, ideas, issues, please send them through to me. I will take the time personally to get back to each and every one of you. It might be a simple thanks, it might be a long-winded answer. But if you've got any questions, don't think because I'm not here answering on the spot that I won't make myself available to be here for you. We are part of the same public education family. And so please feel absolutely confident to send through any questions at all. Any suggestions, any celebrations that you'd like me to know about, anything at all, don't hesitate to email me. Remember. Karen Job Jones, 21, because I'm not. My closing comments will be short, but they'll be heartfelt. Being part of our public education family is an extraordinary privilege, but it carries profound responsibilities. I'm in my 40th year as an educator with public education. I dreamed of being a teacher. I thought it was the most worthwhile profession in the world, and I continue to believe that to this day. But what I do know is this, you make a difference each and every day. You're creating legacies each and every day, changing destinies of students in your class by result, not only of the quality of your teaching, but of the relationships that you build with them. If I were asked to name five most influential people in my life, I would name my year four teacher, Mr. Matheson. He would have known me, would have remembered my name, he may have an old, battered, torn school photo of that particular class that he taught. But I do know this. He was a man that took the time to give me confidence. He was a man that celebrated the achievements of every child in his class. He inspired me not only to realise my dream of being a teacher, but to recognise he continues to have a profound influence on my life. He made me believe in myself and yet I've never had the chance to tell him that. I left the school at the end of the year four because I went to an OC class. And I think in those couple of years, I realised how incredibly fortunate I was to have him as my year four teacher. I would have been lucky to have him at any time in my years as a student. And as I went on through secondary, I realised that there are many wonderful teachers in our public education family, but some of us touch the lives of students so profoundly, so significantly, that we change the course of their lives. And Mr Matheson was one such teacher. You are that teacher to students in your class. And while I never got the chance to say thank you to Mr Matheson, I've never seen him since I left that school at the end of year four. 
I carry him in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit as profoundly important to me. Someone that believed in me, someone that changed my life. I never got the chance to say thank you to Mr Matheson and many of the students in your schools have not said thank you to you when they've looked back many years later and realised how profoundly important and significant, significant you are in their lives. So I'm going to say to my Mr Matheson, via you, on behalf of all those students who didn't get the chance to come back and say thank you when they've reflected on how truly important you are in their lives, not only in that year, but in their lives. I say thank you. Thank you for making a difference. Thank you for believing. And thank you for knowing that every moment you touch the life of a student, you have a chance to influence them in the most significant of ways. Teachers truly do deliver the difference. We throw that line away, but I truly believe it. I also know and believe more than ever that we get to deliver the future. We get to create it through the work that we do each and every day. We bring to life dreams through working with students. We change lives. We sometimes feel that we don't, but we do so ever so deeply, ever so long term, and everything we tend to focus on is such a short-term thing. We have students for a year, we have students for a few hours a week or full-time across a week, but we touch their lives. So when I say thank you to you, when I couldn't say it to Mr Matheson, it's heartfelt. I mean it on behalf of those students in your classes. I mean it when I say, I believe you deliver the difference. I believe it when I say you touch the lives of kids today for their futures. Australian society is richer because of our strong public education family and you are an integral member of that public education family. In delivering the difference, I ask you to continue to work very strongly with the Karana Local ACG, with Mingaletta, to learn from this local community. But don't underestimate the importance of also learning Aboriginal cultural knowledge from some of your students and their families. Learning from your colleagues. The greatest learning we get is those conversations we have with colleagues that add to the quality of our practices in our classrooms. They make the difference, as you do. Thanks to each and every one of you. I hope you have the ma most magnificent day, listening and learning, having yarns in your own school groups and recognising that individually you make a difference. So imagine how powerful you are as a learning community, let alone members of our great public education family. Thank you.